please join me in welcoming today's presenter. Um, Maggie Mapes is the introductory course director in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Kansas. She oversees courses with more than 2,500 students a year and is the author of an open public speaking textbook entitled Speak Out, Call In, Public Speaking as Advocacy. As a scholar, her research emerges from the intersections of critical pedagogy, feminism, and cultural studies. She lives in Kansas City with her partner and three dogs. Please join me in welcoming Maggie Mapes. Thanks, Maggie. Hi, thanks, Sarah. I really appreciate that introduction. And I'm hopeful that you won't be hearing any of my dogs. I actually just, Sarah knows, we adopted a Rottweiler puppy over quarantine. And so he is sleeping somewhere in the house. So apologies if he tries to say hi to you throughout the session. Um, I want to start by thanking the Open Textbook Network. They are such an incredible group of people. And it's such an honor to be able to talk with you about something that I care so much about. Like Sarah mentioned, I'm the introductory course director for KU. And so what that means is I supervise the core curriculum courses at KU, which includes our introduction to public speaking class, our honors public speaking class, our online public speaking class, and also our 300 level business public speaking. Needless to say, um, I think and talk about public speaking on a pretty regular basis. Um, and also, like Sarah mentioned, I was lucky to partner with uh, the University of Kansas Libraries to create an open textbook, Speak Out, Call In. So public speaking has been such a great way for me to get to talk not only about public speaking, but also about open textbooks, um, open educational resources and open advocacy and access more broadly and more generally. And I know many of you are also here um, because you're interested in learning how to talk about open educational resources and learning how to talk about open textbooks. So you might be wondering, in that framework, why would public speaking matter? How does public speaking fit into this conversation related to open textbooks? Um, and so today for me, um, I feel like there are tons of missed opportunities where we could utilize public speaking skill sets in a, in a range of communication contexts to be able to advocate for the kind of information that we need and that we know our colleagues and administrators, for example, our students um, should have or need to know, but that we might be not taking advantage of those um, or using public speaking to be able to take advantage of those skill sets. So for the next I don't know, 40 minutes or so, I am going to avoid just giving you a list of public speaking to do's and to don'ts. Uh, instead, I'm really going to ask that you work with me to reframe the usefulness of public speaking as applicable in everyday situations. And to accomplish that, um, I want to start by challenging a couple of assumptions or things that often happen when we are asking or when we're having conversations about public speaking. Too often in my experience, when we think about public speaking, we think about good public speakers and bad public speakers who, uh, for example, we might give examples of the Kennedys. You know, we know the Kennedys are great public speakers. They have certain qualities. They sound a certain way. They look a certain way. They're credible in a certain perspective. And while that can be helpful when we think about how we want to model public speaking skills, that can also be incredibly exclusionary. Because for many of us, we might not view ourselves in those examples of good public speakers. We might not feel like we have those same qualities that we look like or sound like uh, the people or examples that we constantly get shown about public speaking. So because of that, I often deal with people who say, I could never view myself in a framework of a public speaker because I'm not good in the way that good has been defined through public speaking. So it's really exclusionary. So instead of talking about who is or who is not a good public speaker, um, I want us to start by taking one step back and really asking, what is public speaking? What is it? And how might we be able to accomplish it once we can have kind of a better or broader, more inclusive definition of what public speaking might look like? 
And for me, there are two barriers that constantly, that I'm constantly confronted with in public speaking conversations around context and around the experience of public speaking. So that first barrier is about context. And I'm going to guess that some of you may uh, have this perspective, which is, I don't have to think about public speaking because never in a million years would I voluntarily stand on stage in front of a live audience and talk about an idea or issue. There is no way I'm going to accept a keynote presentation. Um, there's no way that I'm going to try to lead um, a committee or report in front of an audience. I have way too much anxiety and you can't envision yourself as a public speaker in that traditional format. But that is a barrier that helps and, and really hinders how we can understand or define public speaking because it only defines it as happening in a very particular context, which is there's one speaker, perhaps we're on some kind of a platform. You probably envision a podium as always. There are groups of people who are looking at us and that's a really um, limiting understanding and definition of what public speaking could possibly be. Instead, I want you to think about public speaking as any opportunity for you to move an audience. Any opportunity for you to be able to move an audience. Anytime you have someone where you could potentially provide them information. So that allows us to extend the context of public speaking rather than meaning this, which is I'm standing in front of a stage on a stage and I am absolutely horrified um, to being a little bit more general and approaching different communication contexts. So that's the first barrier that I often see. The second barrier relates to the experience of public speaking. And that is when we're invited to present in a more formal setting, even this, for example, maybe you're invited to present findings for a committee. So you know that you have to present to write a speech and you're gonna prepare. What happens is something I call over planning and under preparing which is I'm gonna sit on my computer, I'm gonna write out every single word that I think I'm gonna say, then I'm gonna copy and paste those words onto a presentation aid, and my presentation aid, that becomes my public speech. Right? So I've planned every word I wanna say, but haven't acknowledged that public speaking is a particular experience for an audience that emerges out of a context and is highly embodied. So the way that an audience experiences a speech is significantly different and should be significantly different than whether or not they're gonna read the manuscripts or read something that you write out word for word. I constantly work with people who have trouble giving speeches because they never once listened to the words they were going to say out loud never thought about the kind of story that they were going to tell an audience and the way that would be received or perceived from that embodied vocal perspective rather than from a manuscript or written perspective. So having us really think about not just the context of public speaking being extended, but also the kind of experience that we can provide for an audience and that you are an integral component of both of those ideas. So if we think about these then, the, the question that I'm really interested in having us answer is, how can we utilize public speaking in diverse communication contexts that create unique experience that moves an audience? How can we take public speaking skills in a diverse, in diverse communication context to try to create a unique experience that moves an audience in a way that perhaps they might not otherwise be able to experience that? So let's dive slightly deeper into each of these potential components. So first is context. Um, we're able, again, if we think beyond public speaking as just standing in front of an audience, that means then as advocates for, for example, open education or open textbook, that we have a wide range of potential opportunities to be able to have important planned conversations that can create a unique experience and motivate people to care about the things that we care about and to advocate for students to get the resources that we know that they potentially need. Rather than, for example, just standing on stage and talking about open textbooks, this means that context could include faculty meetings, um, other types of committee meetings, all staff meetings, again, any time where you have an audience. 
when we think then about what constitutes a context for public speaking, these are some of the things that we often as public speaking scholars ask that you consider. Purpose, which is why are you there? Medium, where is it taking place? And audience, which is who is there? And I'm gonna first start really by talking about audience and purpose. Um, audience is the most important part about public speaking. Who you're talking to dictates how and what you, would, you need to say um, to that particular audience member. Um, earlier when I had mentioned that we have a tendency within public speaking to talk about what a good public speaker looks like and sounds like, one of the big problems with that kind of approach towards public speaking is it universalizes a public speaking experience rather than having us understand that the context, who we're talking to, is always incredibly important to dictating what we would need to be able to say to those individuals. It's much, much different, of course, as you all know, when you're talking to students um, versus your partner or a friend, for example, um, and that you would always be able to change the kind of information that you're going to provide. And that's what's key when you think about context from a public speaking perspective. Um, so focusing on audience first and foremost helps us also get out of a mindset of what do I want to say to how can I present this information to the individuals that are present? How do I need to change the information to make sure that it fits within the individuals who are present? So audience becomes incredibly important. And you likely, within many of these communication contexts, already have a diverse amount of information about your audience that you could utilize. If you're faculty, for example, and you're in faculty meetings, you know what kind of audience your colleagues might be and you can use that information to make sure that even your three to five minute committee report about your OER working group, that that information is pointed and purposefully tailored to make sure that those individuals are listening to you. For example, you might have people in faculty meetings who, surprise, after five minutes are doodling on their agenda. They're texting on their phone, right? That's information that's important for you to keep in mind that you are going, it's going to be very difficult for you to sustain their attention longer than that five minutes, um, but that you can still craft content with a key purpose, um, with the purpose of the faculty meeting in mind to make it very worthwhile for them. So audience and purpose are also really connected. The audience of who and the purpose of why you're actually here. Why are you there? How much time do you have, for example? Um, and how can you utilize purpose in a way that's really important? Purpose is key too because purpose um, influences audience expectations. When you are asked to provide information or speak to an audience, they have particular expectations about what's going to occur within that context. And you have to be aware of how you're either meeting those expectations or breaking those expectations or norms within that meeting. There are norms within a faculty meeting. Um, and so thinking about the purpose of that faculty meeting will be important about what information you can possibly be able to provide um, within that amount of time. So why you are there. Um, I think uh, thinking about audiences is really hard. And one thought experiment that I always ask people to do is to be honest with yourself about what kind of audience member you are. So what are things that um, you need to do in order to sustain your attention as an audience member? What are things that really draw you out or draw you into a speaker? How can you really work to replicate those things, acknowledging that audience members and keeping an audience's attention is a very, very difficult task to do. So thinking about and being honest about who you are as an audience can really help you gain some insight into what you need to do in order to sustain that connection and energy with different audience members across those different contexts and purposes. The last thing, of course, is the medium, which is where is it going to take place? Um, uh, uh, more and more, obviously, especially right now in our current context, you are going to be having opportunities to talk over Zoom, for example, um, or uh, in, a, in a way that is more socially distanced. You might not be able to be having those conversations in a traditional format that you've been prone to in the past, that the medium has altered what you're able to, to do and accomplish. And so 
thinking about that medium, thinking about how it might um, influence how an audience or how you're going to be able to interact with an audience is also going to be really, really important when you think about what you're going to be able to accomplish. And the reason that I mention context is context will always dictate the kind of experience that you can create for the audience. Because context is never universal, so having information about who you're talking to, the medium that you're using to talk about it in, and the purpose or why you're going to be there uh, is all going to influence the sort of experience that you can create for an audience. Uh, and uh, I recently, when, when working with a student, um, they, they told me something which was really eye-opening, I think, and important for us to think about as we make sense of public speakers, which is they had done their, in, their introductory speech, a short speech. I asked that they watch that speech and, and make a couple of notes about things they would like to do better in terms of the delivery of that information. They'd done a great job figuring out context crafting content around a specific purpose that was related to an audience. And so I asked that they reflect on the sort of experience, how they delivered that content to an audience. And the students said that they really wished that they could get rid of their accent. They really wished that, the, that they could eliminate their accent because they felt like their authentic presentation was somehow incorrect that the experience that they were providing for the audience um, wasn't okay. And that is such a great example for us to kind of think about, again, ways that we can step out from our expectations of what a good speaker is, and instead really trying to challenge ourselves to accept and create diverse types of experiences for different types of audiences and contexts. So that when you think about how do I as a speaker create or craft an experience that's worthwhile for an audience, that you get to spend time with yourself and accept and acknowledge that the type of speaker that you are, the authentic presentation of your speaking self, is enough for the audience. Unfortunately, uh, we will do any and everything in our power from disallowing the audience to actually experience us. Right? We'll have long, long, complicated presentation aids. Um, people will try to mimic the presentational style of other people. We will never rehearse or listen to ourselves or think about uh, or, or hear ourselves or watch ourselves what other people might be experiencing as speakers. We'll never reflect on what we did. We'll, again, we'll do everything in our power so that an audience doesn't experience us. Um, I work with people who the suggestion that they move from outside behind a podium is the scariest suggestion I could ever give them because they've never been told that part of giving a public speech is providing energy for an audience and asking that audience to experience you and that that is an okay and important part of creating a public speaking persona and advocating for an idea. You are an integral part of that experience and to learn how to create an experience for an audience in that particular context is about you um, really showcasing the, the really incredible components of yourself as a speaker. And that is not stable or universal. There are tons of different ways that you can ask an audience to consider uh, experiencing the content around your public speech. That means you can absolutely use more traditional public speaking norms like a podium, for example, or a more traditional presentation aid, but it also means that you get to think about tons of different choices around that experience for a speaker and that, that those are choices that will influence how the audience understands and experiences your content. Me sitting in front of a bookcase is an experiential choice for the audience, right? a purposeful choice, um, and that those are choices that really, really matter. And so when we think about experience, that experience as a whole, there are just a few things I'll talk through that you can put in the forefront of your mind. Yes, what you write, the story that you tell, the research that you include is important, that content related to context but the experience of you embodying that material for your audience is also an integral component of that public speaking, um, of the public speaking situation. 
And one that unfortunately, like I'd mentioned at the beginning is the scariest part and often the part that, that we run and shy away from because we don't feel like we're good enough. We don't feel like we check the boxes of those great public speakers, but you do. And here are some things that you can think about to make some purposeful choices. Um, so I often like to say there are always things about the experience for an audience that you can control and there are things that you have no control over. So for example, what is the scene um, that you're going to be in for an audience? And answering, for example, the medium, where is that taking place? What's the context? Can help you make sense of what you have control over with that scene and what you don't. For example, if you are invited to give a more traditional live presentation on stage, right, it might be important for you to think about whether or not you're going to move around that stage if you have a podium, if you're going to use some kind of presentation aid, um, if you're going to um, use a microphone, for example, how will the scene influence whether or not the audience experiences you? Um, are you going to have lights on? Are you going to dim the lights in certain places or locations? All of those change or alter that relationship between you, the audience, and the scene. The same is true that I mentioned for Zoom. Um, think about perhaps, I'm sure many of us have been on many a Zoom call and how sometimes the scene that that person is in or that the, your colleagues are in can drastically influence whether or not you feel distracted. What you learn about them as a speaker, even if it's implicit, that the audience is making sense of those decisions for you, even if you didn't make sense of them for yourself. So control the kind of experience that you want to have for an audience based on the purpose and context and information that you've used to gather about the audience already. How can you think about the scene? Um, sometimes I think it's helpful for people to think about public speaking as partially an aesthetic experience. That it isn't just you as an audience sitting and listening passively to information that a speaker is giving you. You're not just a speaker that's passively giving information, but that it is aesthetic, that everything that's happening within the scene for you as a speaker is part of the message that's being constituted to an audience. So how can you change that? There are some kind of basic things too. For example, um, you should, <clears throat> especially if you're in an atmosphere like this, not wear the same color that your background is because sometimes you'll look like a floating head. So there are some kind of practical best practices to think about in terms of that scene. What colors are you going to use? Do you find it distracting um, that you can keep in mind? Um, the, the second thing, and I think one of the most important things about the experience, like I'd mentioned, is how you're going to embody the material. How are you going to move around the stage? How are you going to move to interact with an audience? Um, one, one thing I think is really important is uh, you can play with depth or space with audiences. Um, you can change the rate at which you speak. If you, if you speak more quickly at a certain component of a speech, for example, it can often communicate a level of urgency to an audience that you might want to convey that speaking at a softer or slower pace might not necessarily do. If you are walking up closer to an audience, right, you might want to attempt to convey a larger impact or really underscore um, one of the, the arguments that you're making within a speech. So playing with um, and moving around <clears throat> to think about how changing space, changing your tempo, utilizing gestures, moving around can help amplify the story that you're telling with your content. How are you going to embody that information for an audience? Which I know can sound intimidating, um, but it can also be an incredibly powerful tactic to connect with your audience and to also keep them engaged. The third is presentation aids. And if I'm honest, I am usually someone who errs on the more limited side of presentation aids. They're not good or bad in any unique way or sense. But when you're utilizing presentation aids, it can be important to ask some basic questions. Is this accessible? Is the text large enough for everyone? Do I need it? What's the goal or purpose of what I'm asking someone to read or look at? 
Um, am I asking someone to read a bunch of text and listen to me at the same time? What does that do for the information that I'm trying to convey if someone is forced to either listen or read at the same time? Right? How can I take that into account when I'm considering how I want to embody that component of content, how I want to integrate pauses for emphasis? Um, and all of that is just about, again, centering your audience and remembering that in order for content to be effective, you have to provide time for your audience to be able to absorb it. The reason why speeches can be really powerful is often because they are ephemeral, that we really often get to experience it once, um, one time through. And thinking about utilizing your embodiment, the scene and presentation aids to amplify and underscore areas of content that are important without detracting from that, um, from that experience that your audience could otherwise have. Finally, the last two um, are the most difficult components for myself, and I can only speak for myself. Um, the first is preparation, and the second is reflection. Um, if, if we're honest with ourselves as public speakers, um, I, I think we can likely say that, that oftentimes the most difficult or the area that we take for granted is preparing or rehearsing. I will often work with students who say, I don't know what you mean when you tell me to rehearse. I don't know what it looks like to rehearse a public speech. And I don't have an answer about what rehearsal necessarily looks like, but I can give you a little insight into what I do, even what I did for today, which is I took a piece of paper. I should have brought it for you. I took a piece of paper. I wrote key ideas down. I poured myself some coffee and I walked around my house and started talking about main ideas or things or themes that I thought would be important. For me, that's, that assists me in visualizing. One, I'm a much more visual mapper. So rather than going into a Word document and thinking in a more linear fashion, which really stifles my ability to think about the overall story that I'm telling, I'm able to say, uh, I'm more of a visual mapper. I'm going to think about mapping those ideas and then I'm gonna talk out, the, out loud at them just to myself and my dogs <laughs> while I'm drinking some coffee. I can rework ideas and then I can write some key notes down that might be able to translate those ideas for myself. That's how I prepare. But until you play around with potential rehearsal techniques or ideas that might work for you, um, then you'll never be able to figure out a method or a mechanism so that you feel comfortable and confident when you do stand on stage or when you do walk into a faculty meeting and you have three minutes of core important information that you wanna move your audience to think about and really motivate them to act on and on your behalf. So thinking about how, how you can prepare um, and what you can do to do better during that next time. And again, preparation is going to look different based on the context that you're going to be speaking in. So going into a faculty meeting, going into a committee meeting, that preparation might look a little bit different because the context is different. The purpose is different than if you're going to do a formal presentation like this, which might be thinking about transitioning between your presentation slides, asking yourself, where do I need to really challenge myself to slow down? That's a problem for me. I'm a fast, fast talker. So when I prepare, I have to embed uh, reminders in my notes. Oftentimes I'll take a green highlighter and I'll put them on my notes. And every time I look down, it's a reminder that says, Maggie, take a breath. We're gonna get there, you're going a little fast. But I have to know those things about myself as a speaker before I can change or alter them. In the same way that when you have someone tell you, you really are overusing semicolons in your writing <laughs> and you place that in the forefront of your mind for writing next time, it's the same practice and protocol about being able to um, integrate those changes in preparation for public speaking. And, and that is why the last um, idea about the experience, which is reflection, is so, so important. You have to be comfortable and I know you're not gonna like this. You have to be comfortable listening and watching yourself give speeches. It's the only way that you're gonna have any understanding about how an audience experienced and comprehended what you just did or said. And it's horrible. I know it's horrible. I've done it myself. It's one of the most difficult tasks because 
watching yourself give a speech is an incredibly, incredibly vulnerable act. Standing up and asking an audience to not only just listen to what you say, but try to make sense of it in your body, since it is an embodied experience, is a super, super vulnerable task. And that's why many of us avoid it. Because if we have to go back and look, we can be super critical of the things that we did. But criticism is an act of love. Only when you're really able to look back at yourself and provide criticism to one another about your speech or about each other's speeches, are you able to go back and say, actually, when I prepare, next time I would do this. You know what? I really missed an opportunity to describe this story or example in a new way. Wow, I'm a really fast talker. Whoa, I think I was so excited that I was gesturing so much that that may have been slightly distracting for an audience. So until you're able to think about context, make sense of the experience and reflect, only then are you really going to be able to improve as a speaker and feel more comfortable about what sort of public speaking persona that you want to kind of really work on um, and consider. And I know this is difficult, but the more time you spend with yourself as a speaker, the better experience you can create for the audience. The more time you spend with yourself as a speaker, the better experience you can create for the audience. And even having trusted colleagues that you can check in with, even if it's just three minutes of a faculty meeting, to say to a trusted colleague, hey, was it clear what I was trying to say there? Hey, did, did, I, did it seem like I was addressing everyone in the room? I had a colleague tell me recently, which I really appreciated after a faculty meeting, oh, Maggie, you were only talking to faculty on this side of the room, right? That's a mistake I made about the experience for everyone in the room. And that affected other people, other colleagues' likelihood as audience members to listen to me. Because guess what? I'm not going to, I'm going to be pretty skeptical of an, as an audience member if a speaker isn't even talking to me, looking at me, opening their body up to me, if I'm not able to experience the content, experience their embodiment with it. But without having someone tell me that I had functionally cut off communication with half of that room, I wouldn't be able to reflect back, back on it next time when I go back into the faculty meeting, when I try to move my colleagues to care about certain key ideas that I'm trying to advocate for. So thinking about and reflecting are going to be really important. There, of course, are other things about the experience which are common with public speaking, like everyone should be able to hear you. Um, everyone should be able to see you, think about making eye contact, right? All of those things can be important to integrate, but there is no tried and true universal way as a public speaker to think about being effective at creating an experience for an audience in every single context. So until you spend some time opening yourself up to practicing public speaking skills, even in contexts that you might not have otherwise deemed to be formal public speaking situations, only when you begin to practice that will you feel more comfortable in the diversity of contexts that you'll find yourself in advocating for, for example, things like public, uh, excuse me, things like open textbooks or resources for undergraduate students or the necessity to continue to fund libraries, for example. The last thing I want to mention is um, that it's really important not just to spend some time thinking about who you are as a public speaker, but it is equally important for you to think about who you are as an audience member, the kind of expectations that you hold when you're listening to someone speak. Because the norms that we have about what a good public speaker looks like, what a good public speaker sounds like, those norms that my student knew that when, when, when she wrote to me that she was ashamed of her accent, that those come from somewhere. And so only when we're really able to challenge those assumptions and norms that we have of our very own perceptions of what a good speaker is, will we be able to <clears throat> expand and become, <clears throat> excuse me, more inclusive and understanding about the different types of embodiment that public speaking can really take. So spending time and honest, being honest with ourselves that say, for example, um, what kind of judgment did I make a, about that speaker who might not have, have, have dressed in a way that I thought that a credible public speaker could have dressed? 
what are some of the class-based assumptions that I have up upholding about how credibility is tied with business professional attire, for example? Right? Can I challenge um, what race I think a good public speaker looks like, how they sound, what credibility means? That we have to spend time thinking about and challenging our own assumptions related to that related to those norms so that we are able to invite people into opportunities of public speaking and and not just train um, normative embodiments to continue to be the exemplar examples of what good public speakers could should um, and might be for the future. So those are a few things I hope uh, that have been helpful really as you think about how you could practice public speaking in diverse contexts, challenge yourself to not just over plan, but also really think practically about preparing and creating an experience for your audience that centers you, that really highlights you um, and, and moves an audience towards something that you know is worthwhile. So <clears throat> let's see if you have any questions I could potentially answer, clarify. Maggie, thank you so much. That was, I really, gosh, I, I speak publicly all the time and I've learned so much in this talk and you really challenged me to think deeply about what I do in front of a room on a Zoom call, even in those short um, presentations. And that has really um, helped me reflect on what I do and what I want to do um, as well as what it's like for my audiences. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, if you have a question for Meggie, um, we're a small enough group where um, please feel free to unmute yourself or feel free to put questions into the chat, whichever makes you more comfortable. If you do put it in the chat, I will read it out loud. So we'll give everyone a moment. We had no dog interruptions, surprisingly. I can't believe that <laughs> the puppy didn't want to say hi. <laughs> um, and I should note too, I had my information at the top, but I'm always open if you have resources that you use that you think would be worthwhile. Like I mentioned, since I do work with um, so many sections and train graduate students that we are having lots of conversations about not just what public speaking is, but but the pedagogy around public speaking. And so I know many of you also have great experiences and areas of expertise that I also could utilize and would love to hear from you as well. Maggie, I will ask you a question actually. You mentioned a number of times, um, you know, those brief meetings. And I think that that is such a challenging space. Um, I. When I used to go to pitch um, OER or for the library at department meetings per se, and you're given you know, five minutes in front of the room, and it reminds me of what you were saying, what you can control and what you can't control. Um, but are there, are there any particular things that you really would hone in on for those very brief um, interactions um, where you don't have as, as much time to prep when you really are having to, to just get up and go. Is there anything in particular you would share with us um, about those interactions? Yeah, those are definitely difficult. Um, I would suggest having one key takeaway. Um, I don't know about you all, but sometimes I feel like what can happen in those meetings is uh, it doesn't, you know, someone is, is rambling may not be a fair characteriz characterization, but because they have so many thoughts, because oftentimes someone who's being asked to talk in three to five minutes has so much more they could potentially say, they try to say it in three to five minutes. And so oftentimes as audiences, we're left with kind of thinking, well, we learned some stuff, but I don't know what you wanted me to leave with, where you're trying to move me towards. So even if that means taking 20 seconds on your agenda, and starring, I usually try to say, I have two key things I want to talk about. I'm going to number them for you. I'm going to review them for you again. And then I'm going to be pointed about what I want you to do with that information. Because they're your colleagues. You can always follow up. You can invite them to follow up with you. Um, but be clear and think about what you can accomplish and what information you want to accomplish in those three to five minutes, acknowledging that you can't give them all the information um, right there. And that if you attempt to do so, that it might be really detrimental. 
Meggy, thank you. I think that that's a great segue into one of the questions we received in the chat. Um, the, que the question is, um, I do presentations often. One of the things that always seems to happen to me is I lose my thought as I am talking and then get internally panicked when I can't get back on track and end up forgetting some of the points I wanted to make sure to mention. What would you suggest to mitigate this? I think one um, myth about public speaking is that you can't have any notes. Um, I actually, um, when I did one of the Open Textbook Network presentations, I had someone come up to me afterwards and she said, oh my gosh, I didn't know, I, I'm giving a speech tomorrow. I didn't know I could have notes with me. Um, and so I think that that can be something to really think about for yourself. I can be absolutely the same way. So I can, I can often try to memorize too, like every single word, what's exactly what I want to say. And instead, I really invite people to try, we call it in public speaking, extemporaneous speaking, which is what are some kind of key notes that you can rehearse with and practice with that you know you can return to? Not again, word for word, not a whole manuscript, um, but a kind of key outline. And again, because I'm a visual person, I will print those off and that's what I will use rather than um, get flustered, my brain will actually visualize for me where I am on those notes. And so my eyes will, will go kind of functionally directly to where I'm at so that it helps relieve some of that stress. I have something there that I know can really ground me and I've rehearsed with them. So that really helps me also understand where my eyes will need to go, where I'm at on the page so that I can look to find those notes. But, but um, yeah, that would be my, my suggestion. Great, Maggie. Thank you so much. Um, it's uh, on the other side, we have a, uh, a comment. I wear two hats as a professor and a minister. What suggestions do you have for reducing my dependency on a typed manuscript when I preach or speak? Um, I think one, one question I might ask back is, do you, how do you think a manuscript affects the experience that you're creating for the audience? So one reason why often we say to be careful about a full manuscript is that people will read it um, directly, which can affect their ability to move, for example, around the room. It can affect their ability to make eye contact or really connect with an audience. I'll say though that there are some speakers who can really master working with a manuscript if you rehearse enough. Um, so if there are parts of your sermon, for example, that you think are necessary to really say word for word, sometimes those purposeful, that purposeful connection of language is necessary. And so knowing those places where I really need to have this word for word, that you can rehearse and still really think about how to connect with an audience, where in other parts, perhaps you rely a little bit less on word for word notes and try that more extemporaneous speaking style or even just an outline that might, might be able to kind of help. So finding a balance, watching yourself um, and, and thinking, what do I wanna change about the experience and how do notes affect that ability for me to change? It's a great point. It reminds me, Maggie, what I so appreciate is, is you encouraging us all to take a personal view to really figure out what works for us. Um, I just saying for myself, I do not like to use notes. Um, I build a lot of presentations with images because those images are very um, easy for me to look at and remember what it is that I actually wanted to say. Um, so it's, I guess, from that extemporaneous speaking perspective, it's not a note um, as much as it's those images really um, help me stay on track, um, which might tell all of you as you see presentations from the OTN that are more image based. That's usually me uh, building those to be able to um, set cues for what we're trying to express. So thank you. That's a great point. And that's exactly right. I mean, I often hear from students like this, this process isn't working for me. And that's okay. You've learned that that process isn't working. So mm -hmm. thinking creatively about that information and how you want to, your, how your experience is with it is also really, really important. I love that example of using visuals as a cue rather than words or language, 100%. Does anyone else have any questions for Meggie? We still have time if you would like to add anything into the chat, including your own experiences of what works for you or what you've experienced, good or bad, 
um, in public speaking around OER. Here we, here's a question coming in, Maggie. I teach students in the classroom somewhat regularly. Do you have advice on recording myself in the classroom other than just doing it and being gentle with myself? Um, I think you, sh you should do it and you should be gentle with yourself. <laughs> um, I, I think one other thing is um, you could also use this as a, as a teaching or pedagogy opportunity. And so I think, yes, spending time with yourself and watching, but if you're really interested in how am I communicating with students to be able to say, hey, students, as, an, as a kind of workshop or um, you know, as an activity, I'm going to record this lecture and I want you to watch 10 minutes of it and, and talk to me about how you experienced it. What was confusing? What changes would you make? Um, how, did you like the presentation aid? Would there have been some other way that you felt like I could have demonstrated that? So it teaches students also to kind of deconstruct or provide some critical thinking feedback for you. It gives, it gives you actual feedback from the audience that you're interested in learning about since that's the audience you're communicating with. Um, it gives you feedback as well. Um, and, and I would also then, of course, spend time just with yourself um, watching it and being very gentle um, as, you, as you think about changes that you might want to make as a teacher. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, there's um, a comment that says, both Sarah and Dave, uh, referring to Dave Ernst, our executive director, have musical instruments in their scene a communication advantage using Zoom. <laughs> uh, I'll just comment briefly that um, I, uh, I was actually thinking about what Maggie said about the scene that you create because I, I sometimes forget um, the scene that I have behind me, especially during certain times of year when I have maybe boxes and packages and all sorts of things going on, but it is, um, maybe a reminder to myself that I should pick up my instrument more often since I see it in so many of my calls. I can't speak to that for Dave. <laughs> no um, musical instruments for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a question. I teach public speaking at a community college. Any open resources you recommend for my students? Well, I would be remiss if I didn't pitch my textbook. <laughs> <laughs> which um, I can go back, but um, there are a few open textbooks uh, in public speaking, I would say. This is not the most effective way perhaps to do this, but there we go. Um, so this is, this book is an open uh, resource. It's available online and they can also get it as a PDF. Um, I'll say this book takes a more critical advocacy based approach, but it does include some resources for like online public speaking, which I know is something as a discipline we're having to quickly have conversations about given the kind of circumstances around the pandemic. Um, I would also always recommend going to the Open Textbook Network and searching um, and really looking at the other types of resources that they might have. One great thing about using OERs in public speaking is that you might decide that my book in its entirety is not exactly what you want, and that's okay. But I know many instructors who will pull a couple of chapters here and there um, and really be able to craft or integrate that content um, in a way that's useful for them. So this book also has instructor resources. And if you have questions about any of that, you could definitely email me. I'd be happy to share other OER kind of resources that we use too. Thanks, Maggie. And I put the link uh, to the Open Textbook Library in the chat. Maggie, I actually have a question for you, um, especially around uh, speaking around OER. For a lot of people, OER is very jargony and um, a bit technical. And so I'm wondering how you, um, again, I'm, I'm really thinking about people that don't get that full hour um, that we often get for the OTN, but those shorter presentations or explanations. Um, are there particular tips you would recommend in talking about kind of jargon or those technical aspects like licensing um, that you would recommend? I always recommend speaking about things that you know and being honest about that. Um, so for me, if I'm, if I'm really going to talk to someone about OERs, I'm going to start by talking about my story related to it, which is I'm, I'm responsible for 
um, th 3,000 students and I'm responsible for the money that they spend on a textbook. And I'd never thought about the politics of textbooks or what it means to ask that many students to spend that much money before. And so that's how I became introduced to it. And so using that as a, as a mechanism to tell my story to get them interested in OER and be able to point them to resources or to people who could answer some more of those technical questions, knowing my own limitations, for example. But instead, most of the time, my, my goal is get them to understand the material impact of OER, get them to be interested in learning, open the door for them a little bit, and then be able to point them to places or locations that can help clarify some more of those more complicated questions that might come up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. We have time for one more question, if anyone else would like to add one to the chat. I'll give it just a moment. You'll notice that I did color coordinate my books in quarantine. <laughs> hmm. Well, Maggie, it, oh, a fantastic presentation. Thank you. And that's a great um, closing for us. Thank you so much, Maggie. I got so much out of this. I hope that all of you that attended this uh, presentation did as well. We will be posting it on YouTube and in the OTN Community Hub for um, future reference as you get ready to present on OER or any other public speaking that you're going to be doing. Maggie, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. Thanks, y'all. It was really great. Um, and again, please reach out any of you if you have questions or suggestions. Uh, uh, I would love to hear from you. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day.